Welcome to Zen and the Art of Real Estate Investing. What if you could learn from experienced real estate investors, find out what got them to where they are now, get insight into their daily habits, and take these insights to inspire your own growth. Each week, Jonathan Green shares an in-depth look at the mindful approach to real estate investing. Jonathan is a lifelong real estate investor, advisor, and coach, as well as the founder and team leader of Streamlined Properties. Whether you're looking to start from scratch, get to the next level, or just for a straightforward and honest approach to real estate investing, Jonathan seeks to provide a free mentorship program you can take with you anywhere. Now, here's Jonathan. We're back with another episode of Zen and the Art of Real Estate Investing, and this one is a big one before I get there. I mean, after you hear this episode, you're going to want to follow the podcast if you're not doing it already. That helps us and it helps you get them in your inbox on Monday and Thursday mornings with no fail. They'll be waiting for you. What's waiting for you today on this episode is Henry Washington. We're going to talk about his entire journey in just six years from having $1,000 to over 100 units, coaching, training, speaking, doing it all. He's going to talk to you about how to become a real estate deal maker. And P.S., that's the name of his upcoming book for Bigger Pockets. Let's go right now. This is episode 109 of Zen and the Art of Real Estate Investing with my guest, Henry Washington. You're going to want to listen up for this story. Six years ago, Henry had a thousand in the bank. Now he has 116 rentals or more doing at least 15 flips a year. He's the co-host of one of my favorite podcasts on the market by Bigger Pockets, And he also has a Bigger Pockets book coming out in May, Real Estate Dealmaker. Henry, welcome to the show. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. Glad to be here. Yeah. Oh, and I forgot we were on a panel together at BPCon, which is where we finally met in person. So it was actually cool to meet you in person before we do this, because I feel like we know a little bit more about each other. So uh, thanks for taking Absolutely. this time. Man, thank you for having me. Long time coming. Glad I get to do it. Yeah, man. So how old were you when you first started to think about real estate? I was 36. See, this is why I ask, because that's awesome. I think a lot of people listening think, oh, if they didn't think about it when they're 18, they can't do it. Yeah. Why didn't you think about it, though, before 36? I didn't know I needed to. <laughs> I was I, I was raised by my pretty traditional parents in terms of like education. Like they wanted me to go to college, get a degree, get a good job, climb the, climb the corporate ladder. If you think about it from the perspective of being, you know, uh, a black American born in the eighties. That means my parents were obviously coming up earlier than that. And yeah. there was just less professional black people in the workplace. And so like for them to be able to offer me a life where that was a possibility is a really big deal. And so my whole life, it was like pounded in my brain with a hammer, like you're going to college and you're going to go get a good job. And like, and so like, I didn't like, it was just what I, was going to do. And then I did all those things and realized that I still couldn't afford the life I felt like I wanted even through doing that. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of people are, of course, are still struggling with that now because everything costs more. Yeah. What was the one thing that finally got you to real estate at 36 or, or a little bit more? My wife, I got married <laughs> and started doing the math on you know, we, we tried to buy a house together. I couldn't be on the loan. But when you're doing the math on, okay, we're trying to buy this starter home, that's stretching us. Like, it's clearly not the house we want to live in forever. And I'm doing the math on like, well, how many years and how many raises and promotions is it going to take us to be able to get to like this, this place where we want to be, you know, in our minds. And it was like unfathomable. So I was like, there's got to be a better way. Well, I had a panic attack and then that led me to look at about real estate. But yes. Yeah. As what so where did you find it? Did you like come across bigger pockets or did you pick yeah. up a book? What was the first thing that kind of made the light bulb pop up? Yeah, yeah. I was <laughs> uh, I, I recently spoke at an event and the guy was he knew my, my story and he was telling it and he made this hilarious joke. He was like, Well, when you're panicking about not making enough money, literally having a panic attack at three in the morning, you have no idea what you're going to do. You just go to the one thing, that one place, you know, 
that will help you out of a situation like this begins with the letter G. Google. <laughs> yeah. Pass on prayer. Right. Go to Google. <laughs> Uh, and, and so, yeah, no, I, I Googled it at three in the morning and uh, uh, just started seeing that people, normal people, bought real estate. Now, said differently, I am a Christian. I pray a lot. So prayer absolutely helps. But yeah. it was a good old Google. It was the prayer that led me to the Google search that led me to real estate. Yeah. And I mean, right when you came upon it, I, I'm sure you didn't think, hey, you know, in six years, I'm going to have over 100 rental units. How did you yeah. really start? taking action on what you pulled no. from Google that, that early morning. My, uh, <laughs> I have my, my original goals. We wrote our goals in a, in a little notebook. we found this notebook in an airport. It was a goals notebook and it was li literally like pigs with wings on it on the cover. Like, you know, write all the things that you would accomplish when pigs fly in here. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so our original goals, when we decided we were going to invest in real estate, were to buy one house a year for the next five years and then see if we want to do more. Right. That's what, that, like, that seems like a lot to me. Like that was yeah, almost right. was unfathomable. Right. Yeah. And after we did our first one, I realized how not unfathomable that was. And we did, uh, we did five deals in our first month. So, so was the question like, like how did we get going so quickly or what? Yeah, I mean, so where did you find the first deal and how did yeah. you know, like, this is okay. This is actually going to be something we're not going to lose on. Cause I think that when you're in that, you know, I, I did. there's just no, you, you have to, you have to figure it out. That's what it sounds like you were trying yeah, to do. No, I didn't. So yeah. I, I, to, so uh, taking action so quick, that's originally what you asked. And so what happened was Google led me to knowing that real estate was a thing. And so then I had to figure out how to go do this thing. And I didn't know. And so I was like, I just need to find people who are doing it. There's got to be people in my backyard who are doing this. And so I just Googled real estate investor, you know, groups, meetups, clubs, like anything I could find where investors were in a meeting. Uh, I went, so I found my local RIA and a couple other groups and I would just go to every, like I was going to three to four meetups per month, every month consistent. Like I was always in the room. Oh, yeah. it's like people. So I was in the room so much that people had no idea I'd never done a deal. They just assumed I was like <laughs> killing it because I'm like at all these meetings. Yeah. But that, I mean, that's a really important point because one, the most of them were probably free, if not all of them. Yeah. It's just a matter of, are you taking the time and can you get over the hump of, you know, what, not feeling imposter syndrome to just be in the room? And, and what do you think like them seeing how frequently I was in these meetings and then learning I hadn't done a deal? What do you think that made them want to do? Like they they work with you like this, this yeah. pretty motivated. Yeah, they yeah. wanted to help me. So, Wouldn't you feel uh, the same way now though? If you saw 100%. somebody come in, you know, ten meetings 100%. in a row, you're like, I got, I got to put this skin on. We got to do something. One hundred percent. That's the person you want to help, right? They're the ones that are that are that are putting themselves out there, and 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 you know, we we all get asked a million times, "Can you help me? Can you help me?" But asking, "Can you help me?" and and willing to do what I tell you to do when you ask that is two different things. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. And I, well, I would always say, I, I want to see what you think about this. I, th there's a specific ask, like you said, there's somebody coming in and having like, Hey, I'm really trying to get to X. I've worked my money this way. And they give you a, like, a very brief backstory, not a half hour, right. but they have a point and they just really want you to just, just tip them to the next step as opposed to somebody coming and say like, Hey, I don't know what to do. How do I yeah. become an investor? That, we can't answer that. Yeah. It's impossible. What do you, well, what kind of deals do you want? Uh, you know, as long as anything, <laughs> anything, <laughs> as long as it makes money, <laughs> that's right. my favorite answer. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. How much money do you have? Oh, whatever. Yeah, I mean, whatever. like, okay. You know, it's yeah. not, it's not distinct enough to be able to help someone like that. Yeah. So, so for me, uh, going to the meetups consistently, cause I just wanted to see people doing it. And then the other big action step I took, these are all easy stuff people can do. So the other big action step I took was more of a mindset trick. So I just started telling everybody that I was an investor. I've always been a believer in like, you get what you give, like what you put out is what you get back. That's just how life works. And so I was like, I'm going to start putting it out there that I'm an investor. So I start getting the stuff that investors get. I don't even know what that means, but I want it. So <laughs> I'm going to start telling everybody I was an investor. And so I would introduce myself like that to people when I met new people. I would, uh, I'm Henry. I'm a real estate investor. And I also do data analytics for Walmart. Like I put my day job second because in my mind, like the real estate was going to get me beyond the day job. So I might as well put that first. And that's what led me to my first deal. A buddy of mine who worked in the same building as I did heard through somebody 
that I was buying real estate because I was just telling everybody. And he was like, dude, I didn't know you were doing that now. And I was like, yeah, man, totally. He was like, man, I need to sell my house. And I was like, yeah, let's, let's talk about it. And he, yeah. he said, man, I, uh, and I knew his house. I'd been to his, like we were friends. And so I was like, I didn't know you weren't living there anymore. And he was like, yeah, man, I moved out. I let a guy from church move into it. As long as he covered the mortgage, I let him stay there. He was uh, working on his credit so he could buy it from me. And then I was going to take the money from that sale to buy this other couple plots of land and house for the church because he was really, really involved in his church. And he was, and yeah. I was like, okay. And he was like, well, the time has come. I have to buy it because he was buying it from somebody else in the church. And so it was really time intensive. He's like, I got to sell. I need the money in 30 days to buy this property or I'm going to miss this opportunity. I got to sell this house. I'll sell it to you for 116,000. It's worth like 150, 160. I don't care what it's worth. I just know if I sell it for 116 to you with no real estate agent, I make exactly the amount of money I need to go do what I need to do. And I was like, yeah. all right, I'll buy it. <laughs> and he was like, that, oh. that goes to exactly what you were doing at the meetups. Cause yeah. if you weren't just putting yourself out there, that yeah. never would have even came never to would you. Have came about. Right. And people say, Oh, it was luck. It fell in your lap. It's not luck. It's positioning. Right. Like you position yourself to be ready for the opportunities when they come. It looks like luck to the outside person, to the person on the outside looking in. Yeah. Deal fill in my lap. But I positioned myself to to be ready. And then it was it it was even more than that because I had a thousand dollars in my savings account. I had bad credit. Like I had none of the things that would make you feel <laughs> like saying yes to buying a house in 30 days is a good idea, right? Like none of yeah, those things. Right. But I was like, he was like, yeah, so as long as you can close in 30 days, you can have it for 116. Will you buy it? And I was like, of course I'll buy it. Absolutely. <laughs> no problem. Yeah. He let was, me just go. Let me pick that up right now. He was like, so, so what do we do now? And I was like, uh, Oh, hold on. <laughs> so I went, <laughs> I went back to tomorrow. My, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I went back to my desk and, and I Googled, how do I buy a house without a real estate agent? Because I had no clue what to do next. Yeah. And it was like, I well, mean, you hadn't even found bigger pockets at this point. I, I had. Oh, this is awesome. I had, yeah, yeah. but I, I, I didn't like all of it is just random information until it's the <laughs> right, information right. that you need in the moment right so yeah, now just a bunch I'm of like, websites yes yeah. so now i'm like trying to like pointedly google search and search through bigger pockets to find out what i need to do and it was like well you need to put it yeah. in a contract and i was like cool what's that mean so i had to google <laughs> like under contract and it was like well you need to sign a purchase and sale agreement i didn't know what that was or where to get one literally downloaded a purchase and sale agreement template off of bigger pockets just yeah. changed the names in there to his name and my name. And then we signed this rando contract off of the internet that no lawyer looked at that I'm aware of. And so like, like that's bad financial advice, but it's good <laughs> mindset advice. Like that's the mindset yeah, you need to but, move forward. Yeah, it's action. And I mean, you can make a contract on the back of a napkin if both yeah. parties agree and are of sound mind. So, I mean, it can be valid and it, it is part of taking action. I just wanted to drop back on one thing because I think it's important when when you were talking about the, the fact that people find it to be lucky that you lucked into that deal. I think I would correlate that to what, how people, you know, call people an overnight success. Yeah, Nobody's an overnight success. They're yeah. just toiling in the background for eight, 10 years right. doing the same thing. And then one day it finally explodes. And I was like, oh, look at that. You know, they got lucky and they don't realize 10 yeah. years they're just in the room trying to work it I out realize so all the that, that was important. oh man yes yeah. i get it so yeah. how did you how did you close the deal money wise that that's yeah. really like you got the contract okay yeah. step one but now you need to get the money you haven't even heard the best part bud <laughs> so i get the contract and then that was my literal next thought and i was like okay what do i do now i need money <laughs> where do i get money who has money banks Banks have money. I'll go to a bank. Which bank should I go to? I know. I'll go to the bank that's across the street from my office. Like that's the analysis I did <laughs> on which lender that I needed to go to. With it's this right deal. there. I was like, yeah, there's one right yeah. here. I'll just go over there. And so John, John, I literally went. I, I literally went like this. So I had I had the contract, it, and I walk in the front door, and I'm like. Can I, can someone help me? I need to buy this house. Is there someone I can talk to about this? Like I had a piece of paper and it just so happened that the commercial loan officers were standing in the lobby, you know, shooting the crap with somebody. And he like took it and he was like, yeah, man, come to my office. I'll take a look at it for you. 
and he like looks at the contract and he and he puts the address in Google Maps and pulls it up. And so he, he I remember he kind of he did one of these. He was like, he was like, um, this is a this is worth a lot more than this. And I was like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's why I want to buy it. He was yeah. like, he was like, this is a really good deal. And I was like, yeah. And he was like, we. We'd love to lend on something like this. It's going to require you put 15% down. Do you have 15% down? It's going to be about 20 grand. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love that you're just flying through it with yeah. a, a bunch yeah. of yeses and figuring it out. Yeah. I was like, yeah, yeah, for sure. I got that. And he was like, all right, well. So he sent me this stuff to start the application. And I start filling it out. And so then I go back to my network of investors now with something of sub- substance because I've been building this relationship with all these with these with these investors, right? For, yeah, and you also kind of have verification from yeah. a third party, like, hey, you've got a good deal on the hook yeah. here. Yeah. So I, I went to my investor network and I was like, how the heck are you all finding these down payments? Like, how do I do this? I need twenty grand in thirty days. And one guy in particular sat on the phone with me. So what happened was I was brainstorming on my own. I couldn't figure it out. And so I called this guy who I'd networked with and I knew he was a buyer as well. And I, I really called him to say, Hey, I can't find the money. I need to do something for my buddy. I said, I would close on it. He's in a tight situation. Like I know you can close on it. Like I just take the deal. I don't even need to make anything on it. Just help my friend. And, uh, he gave well, me, and you're giving a gift to him yeah. also. Like, this yeah. is a good deal. I wish I could do it. You yeah. know, here he gave me my first lesson in entrepreneurship. He he went over the deal. He said, "Henry, this is a good deal." He said, "I will buy this." He was like, "But you need to figure it out. If you're going to be successful in this business, you got to go figure it out. Like, this is a good deal. You need to figure out a way to buy it." And I was like, "I don't know how." And so he sat on the phone and he brainstormed different ideas with me. And he's the one who kind of put the bug in my ear about using, he's like, well, you can use a 401k loan. And I was like, ah, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to, you know, cash out my 401k and, you know, the penalties. But doesn't like, that go back to kind of the, what we were all taught and what mm-hmm. our parents, a lot of our parents said like, Hey, well now you got the 401k, just like leave that, let it bake in the oven for a while. <laughs> right. And then you get a little yeah. bit later. <laughs> right. Right. And so I'm like, well, I don't want to cash it out. And he's like, no, you can borrow against it. It's different. You won't pay penalties and fees. You'll actually get, you'll pay it back with interest, but it's your money. So it's your interest too. And I was like, well, that sounds legit. Like you can, he was like, you can borrow up to like 50% of what's in your 401k. And I was like, this is, seems like a cheat code. And I was like, yeah, let's, uh, I'll do that. I just, you know, well, well, I need a 401k to do that. So (laughs) where do I get one of those? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> every step you you yeah. achieve something you've yeah. opened up another thing to figure out right i then went back to my wife who after my panic attack at three in the morning i woke up and i told her we were going to be real estate investors and that's what i figured out at three in the morning and she was like okay that sounds great and so i went back to her now and said hey rem- remember when i said that we were going to be real estate investors and you're like yeah let's do it uh well We need to borrow 20 grand from your 401k so we can buy this house. And she was like, okay. And we had the we had the money. That's awesome. I have to tell you though, over this is episode 109. uh, There's so many stories of partnerships that work because Mm -hmm. the partners just kind of believe in each other Mm -hmm. from the beginning. You know, even either it's a discussion about real estate vesting or a trust in the relationship. Mm -hmm. But I've never found a great conversation where one party's like, you know what, I'm not really into that. And then it worked out. Right, so how right. important was the trust in the relationship to, for her to be able to say like, Hey, yeah, like, let's do it. I got you. Literally would not be here without her because not because she just lent on the first deal, but a lot of people don't know that I almost quit before I got started. I told her we were going to do this. And then about halfway through before I found this deal, I met with a local investor and he basically discouraged me from getting started for, for make a long story short. And I was super bummed about it. And I was like, you know what? He's probably right. Like I need to go save some money first and I'm probably jumping in too soon. And, and she was like, no, you said you were going to do this and you had your mindset on it and you've been working towards it. And now all of a sudden you're not going to do it. No, you're going to do what you said you're going to do. And I was like, okay. And, I got it from there. Yeah. Yeah. But th- there's also, it's interesting that 
you know, we all talk about the five people that you spend the most time around. You, you have two different visions of investors that you talk to one who put you down and then one who lifted you up and didn't yeah. even take your deal. And I think right. that's really important to help people figure out how do you figure out which one is which yeah. in the beginning? Yeah. I don't think the one who discouraged me had bad intentions. I think he was telling me based on what he knew. He was a businessman. So like real estate was just one of the many things that he did. And so like he accumulated lots of money and then would use that money to go invest. Like that's how he got started. His first thing he did was start a business that made him money and then he used that money to invest. And so how he got to where he is, is different than where I was. And so that's kind of what my wife helped me realize is like, you guys are on different paths. You're, you're doing different things. You don't have the same background. The guy who gave me the investment advice, look, anybody who is willing to help you in lieu of them making a profit that's right in front of their face, like, I'm going to, I'm going to take what they tell me with a little more weight, right? Like I'm going to, yeah, be, because there was monetary gain involved for him. He could have just said, you know, yeah, happy. And I would have felt grateful. Like he would have been like, yeah, I'll buy it. I'll help your friend out. Like I would have been grateful. Like he would have yeah. been in a great, yeah, it would, but, but he didn't do that. And so anything that he told me from that point on, I, I just had a sense of trust that it wasn't coming from a selfish place. And you know, that's just, that's hard to find. That's hard to find. Yeah. And I think going back to what we said before, if you hadn't been so consistent at the meetups and been building those relationships, if you've just yeah. been at one meetup and called the guy, he's going to be yeah. like, sure, thanks for the deal, man. Right. <laughs> Appreciate Absolutely. it. Talk, talk to you never. <laughs> right. Absolutely. 100%. Yeah. But, I mean, this is these are the important things for people who are, you know, even if they've been started before and then they can't get restarted because the market's been a little bit wonky, like just keep showing up. You know, meetups, yeah. I think we've talked about on so many different podcast episodes, they're just so important because everything that you've built, if you go back yeah. to this origin story, is all from relationships. Yeah, man. And I think what I, what I tell people is like, yes, everybody knows you need to go to meetups. But what, where they drop the ball is they're not relentlessly, consistently going to the meetups. They'll go for a couple right. of months and then life starts life in and they got to do the thing at the place and they got to do the thing, <laughs> you know, with the people the other time. And right. then, I got to get my car yeah. washed yeah, instead of right. going to the meetup. This right. is so important. Or, the, and, or, or, you know, honestly, a lot of people think now they're going to show up to a meetup someone's going to hand them a deal right. and some money yeah you know and that, then it's all fine one meetup and then you're a wholesaler and the next thing you know you're flipping houses like you, you have to put yeah, in easy the time peasy. easy peasy yeah. <laughs> yeah, man. i mean hey social media makes it look uh <laughs> that looks is pretty easy that is fair yeah so so how did you really start the snowball going you got that first one yeah. and then what happened with that in terms of making money that let you guys know like wow well okay like yeah. we can do this yeah. So I learned early on that if I could solve the two problems that most investors face, that I could grow my business. And I solved one of them by accident and the other one was intentional. So you need deal flow and you need money flow, right? If you've got consistent lead flow and you've got money to buy those properties that isn't your own personal money, you'll buy as many deals as you feel comfortable buying in a given period of time, right? That's just, that's just facts. Like you will. Uh, at your comfort level. And so I solved the money problem because I walked into a local bank by proximity only. It was a local community bank and they saw I was buying a really good deal. They called me after I bought that first property and said, we want to give you a line of credit on the equity so that you can use the equity as, awesome. a down as down payments for future deals that you bring to us. And so they were even willing to say, like, we'll let you leverage what you've already got with us to go buy more property with us. So you won't have to use any of your own money. And that I'm, that's Community Bank 101, though. I mean, I think people always are like, hey, let me go to Chase. If you walked into Chase with a contract, they like laugh you out of the yeah, room. They don't even like have here. money in the banks yeah, there. Get <laughs> out of here. Right. Yeah, they'll give you a number to call. <laughs> yeah, an 800 number. Yeah. You sit on hold for 40 minutes. So what I learned through, you know, continued conversation with this, with this banker is that he was like, essentially what he was saying, he's like, I look great walking in the loan committee with your deals because there's so much equity in them. And if, you know, if, if we lend on a deal to you and you don't make your payment, we will gladly take your asset <laughs> and sell it for more than the, what we were going to make an in interest on your payments. Like is like, he's like, he's, 
And so like I learned the benefits of community banking. I learned how they make money. And, you know, they need to lend to local businesses. That's what they do to make money. And if they had the choice of lending to me, the investor, with a deal with 60, 70 grand in equity or, you know, the guy who wants to start a food truck, they're going to pick my deal every time. Right. And so yeah. I, he was basically saying, we'll get you the money. You just got to go get the deals. And so that left me with the homework assignment. How do I go find real estate deals? And all my research that showed me the best way to find deals was to operate your business like a wholesaler. And so I just started studying wholesalers. Like I read Than Merrill's book, like the Wholesaling Bible. Like I read anything. I, all the podcasts I listened to were all about wholesaling. I did not want to yeah. wholesale. I just wanted to learn how to find good deals. And so I learned everything wholesalers do to find good deals. I started to implement those strategies. They started to bring me deals. I bought everything. Uh, yeah, so I did, I did five assignments maybe in my first couple of years. And then everything else... All the other leads I generated, I either bought them, flipped them and sold them, bought them, renovated them and rent them, or bought them and sold them as is on the market. Like that, And I still that's still what I do today. I operate like a wholesaler. I buy everything that's a deal and I figure out how to make money on it after. Yeah. Hey, it's Jonathan. This is just a brief interlude to talk to you about Deal Machine. Listen, I've used Deal Machine and I was crushing it with my Concerned Citizen postcard on Deal Machine. You can look that video up on my YouTube and find out how I did it. It works. Deal Machine works. I've had David Lecko, the CEO, on the podcast. So if you want a free trial of Deal Machine, the elite Driving for Dollars app, and I'm telling you, it works if you use it correctly, you can go to my link at bit.ly slash Zen Deal Machine. Now, bit.ly is B-I-T dot L-Y slash Zen Deal Machine. It's free and you'll be up and running in two minutes and then you can figure out if you want to keep it. Let's get back to the show. What do you think right now of the overall view of wholesaling like across the nation? Because it, it has a bad name, but I found that there's very, not many, but there are some very, very good wholesalers, but mm -hmm. there's a lot of people just not treating it like a business. If you treat it like a business, I think it's going to run pretty well. But at least where I am, you know, most of the deals I look at are the the typical, you know, what I would think of wholesalers is repair costs too low, ARV yeah, yeah, way yeah, too yeah. high. And you're yeah. like, you're 67,000 off and it only costs 200,000. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I, it, it's if you treat it like a business and you treat it like you're supposed to, which is an avenue for you to help people who need to sell and not yeah. want to sell, right? So you should be providing a service or value to the person whose house you have under contract. And I think when you operate it from that perspective, it can be beneficial for all parties. Unfortunately, most people are just doing it because they know they can make a whole bunch of money. And so it can get predatory. Yeah. I had a deal the other, I bought a house from a wholesaler for 67 grand. And it, at the end of the day, when we were about to close, the seller called and canceled everything because some of the, what he owed ended up being a little more. And he was actually going to have to bring $2,500 to closing. And if I were that wholesaler, and I found out that I was making like a 10 grand commission or 10 grand whole assignment fee, but the right. guy who's selling the house has to bring 25 grand to closing. Yeah. I'm going to make sure he doesn't do that. Exactly. I'm going to take my fee and I'm going to split it with him so that he makes money instead of loses money. And so the wholesaler uh, calls and says, the deal's not going to go through because the guy's backing out because he's, he's got to bring 2,500 to the table. And I'm just sitting here like, so of course I call the title company and I say, and I, and I say, call the, call the owner and tell him I'll pay for his 25 grand, 2,500 plus I'll give him an yeah. extra grand so that he actually walks away from the table with something. So I was willing to pay more and, and those numbers, they weren't great. Like I was pretty much maxed out at the number I was buying it at, yeah. but I wasn't going to lose a deal over a couple grand. And I sure wasn't going to let that seller 
lose money. Yeah, because no, no one's going to come in to solve that problem. Like yeah. you said, that that's a people thing. And I think it goes back to what you said. I, I personally think that all of the best wholesalers that I know are all people who started the business like you to get deals for themselves. And then they're too good at marketing. So they have overage. I can't take mm-hmm. down 10 deals a month in the beginning. So I'm going to give them to my friends. And yeah. then that becomes a real business instead mm-hmm. of like, only looking for this the spread yeah. and that's why they won't move off the 10,000 like if you just took 5,000 that guy's happy you're happy you know you get more deals everyone's good but it's, right. you're exactly right and i see that all the time yeah man so it, it, i just think wholesalers need a little more of a people focus and they need to operate more like an actual you know like an actual business it's just like any like like airbnb right now people say it's dead it's not dead you just got to be good at it you got to be an operator now you just it's the same right. yeah right you just you just can't put it up and think it's going to yeah. work for itself because there's right. too many so right. it's not that it's saturated it's just that there's too many that aren't trying because right. you know hedge funds were buying airbnbs right. <laughs> you know like just like hedge funds are buying all the flips in arizona like that's they don't care about it so it's not right. going to be good then you go you know you hire bridget whitney and then like all of a sudden your airbnb is blowing up off the top because right. it has a, a personality it's just everybody wants the easy thing don't you think and the one the way that the thing that really like opened my eyes when we were at BPCon in October is oh, everybody that I met there was there with good intentions. Mm-hmm. And when you go, when you're around just kind of like on social media and, and sometimes at like larger meetups, you know, everyone's not there with it. They're looking for the quick buck. And mm-hmm. like, if anything, real estate is not the quick buck. It's, it's, so far, that? it's so far from that. Like I was who I was talking to somebody recently and they were like asking me about, you know, being a a landlord and a property owner. And, and I was like, you know, I really do enjoy it. And it's not even good yet. Like I've, (laughs) I've only been doing this since 2017. I still suck. I I haven't hit the good part yet. It doesn't get good to like 10 years of owning rentals when you're paying down more principal and they're all stabilized. Like this is, I'm at the crappy part where I, I spend more money than I make. Like it's, but was was there something about real estate that kind of like recharged you going from traditional jobs? And then how did you end up getting out of when did you know that it was time that you could like pitch the regular job and this was going to be it yeah. full time? I made 70K on my first flip. And I think at that time I was making like ninety five thousand dollars a year. <laughs> it's <laughs> one deal. It's, yeah. That's awesome. yeah. And and so that was the the eye opener that was like, oh, like if I do two of these a year, I'm already making more money than I am at my day job. But I enjoyed what I did. And so I didn't I didn't have a, a plan on quitting. But that was kind of like the proof of concept I, I needed to know. And so I've never been the guy that's like, I'm going to hold everything and never sell anything. I think as a buy and hold investor, if you don't have a job that pays you a lot of cash, you've got to turn properties because the rental properties aren't going to make you a bunch of cash and you've got to reinvest it all. And so like in order for me to make money, I had to be turning properties either through flips, assignments or hotels in order to have cash in my business uh, and have cash on hand. Uh, You know, everybody I know that only buys rentals and never sells them typically has a super high income W2 or some other business that makes them a ton of money. And so I knew I needed to turn some properties to generate cash. And then I knew I needed to by assets that are going to be, you know, wealth generation for the long term. Yes, I want them to cash flow now, but the now cash flow isn't what's important. Yeah, I don't I forget what you asked yeah, me, but yes. I, <laughs> no, I I think assets is such a good term because that means generally these type of assets that we're talking about means multiple exit strategies. So, yeah. if you do have to sell, I mean, that's what the greatest thing about real estate, if you know, you have 10 things, you can sell one of them. Sometimes yeah. even you have to sell it for maybe it's a loss, but you get the money back from your down payment so you can reuse it for something that's going to be a better scale Absolutely. and you're kind of moving the pieces and I agree with you. I think if if someone just had is their whole goal is buy and hold, I I tend to think that they stop kind of paying attention. They just hire property property management and they're yeah. probably getting skimmed for lots and lots of money that they could yes. be doing the properties aren't you know at highest and best use but they're very comfortable because they're making you know minimal returns but that defeats the purpose because you could do it so much so much better have you seen that out there and i mean even as you're scaling you figured out on your own properties <laughs> yeah so for me this year i just turned everything over to property management it was we were pretty efficient at managing you know 30 to 50 units and then as we get 
beyond that. And then some units are in different LLCs with different ownership and partners. Like it all, it gets pretty convoluted pretty quickly. And you can very, it, you'd be amazed at how easily you can realize, oh, snap so-and-so hasn't paid me rent in three months and I'm just now realizing it, right? Like it, that happens, uh, you know? And, and so I had to do the math. I'm like, well, if I pay property management, what's that going to cost me in terms of like, what am I bleeding out of my business right now? Because I can't stay yeah. on top of it all. And then I just so happened to meet uh, a gentleman who he was managing. I have some properties that are about an hour away that I've always had in their management because they're an hour away. Yeah, and they've just done such a great job. And I end up meeting the owner of the company and becoming friends with him and, and like learning more about what he does in his business. And I was like, this is the best property management company I've ever like talked to. And so he opened an office now where I'm currently located. And awesome. I was like, take it all. <laughs> take, yeah. I think the caveat is you've got to find somebody. So you can't just I'm not saying go hire any property management company. <laughs> yeah, <right>? Please don't. <laughs> you've got to hire someone who a. They, they are never going to care about your properties as much as you are, but that doesn't mean that they're not better equipped to handle the problems of your real estate portfolio better than you can. And that is yeah. what I gained through my property management company. They will handle renovations for me and tenant turns. They, they know their business. They do tenant turns in less than 10 days, have the data to prove it and back it up. Right. And so I'm able to confirm the things that they're telling me, but also like, yes, I may pay them 10% on top of what it costs to do the renovation, but they get better pricing than me because of the longstanding yeah. contractor relationships and they can get it done faster than I can. And you've got to calculate those things in as well. Yes, I could go do that turn for probably the same amount or a little less, but it's going to take me 60 days more. Right. And he's going to do yeah. it in 30 days. Right. So you've got to, You've got to understand who you're turning your business over to. And are they really better equipped to handle your portfolio than you are? And if they are, then there's probably some benefit. And if they don't seem like they are, then you need to keep it. Yeah. And I think it's important that you are already an experienced manager. Mm -hmm. So then when you go to the manage the manager stage, you kind of know what you're looking for. So it's much easier to find if there's any holes and you had a trust relationship yeah. for new investors. When they just go in on property management, they don't even know how to manage the manager. So it's yeah. like someone tells them, oh, you know, there's a you know, there was a plumbing call. It's two hundred and forty bucks. They're not saying like, huh? Right. <laughs> right. It's not 240 bucks. They fixed the sink. You know, it should be like $40, yeah. you know, and that that's where I think it's important. You knew because you did it for so long that you can turn over the management and still be involved, but really trust them. And yeah. then to be able to look at the metrics they're sending you. That's a really important part because it. I mean, it, it's really hard. I think a lot of people, the self-managed number is in between somewhere between like 30 to 50 where people yeah. realize like, yeah, that, this is too much. And that's exactly where you were, right? Yeah, 100%. Yes. Well, that's where my wife was that was her job and she is <laughs> eternally grateful yeah. that we have turned it over <laughs> yeah and so what about on the flipping side now i, I know that you're flipping a lot because we spoke about it at, at bbcon mm -hmm. but how's the flipping market been for you it seems like it's been okay whereas everybody was you know complaining yeah. and watching the national news thinking there's no deals out there it seems like you had pretty steady deal flow over the, the last while I don't understand how people don't realize it's a cycle. Like there's always going to be one part that's amazing. And then there's going to be one part that isn't <laughs> as good. Like no matter what the, the market is doing, like uh, two years ago, it was really, really easy to find money for your deals. And it was easy to sell your deals, but it was harder to buy them at a lower price. And so you were making your profits on people bidding up your properties, right? And right. getting multiple offers. And so you're like, yes, I'm killing it. I'm buying this house and I, you know, I put lipstick on it and I'm making 50 grand uh, because it appreciated so much, right? That doesn't happen anymore, but you can still flip properties. Now I make the same amount on average per flip that I was before, but now I can buy them at a deeper discount because there's less competition right. and I'm able to go and, and get better deals. I don't sell them for as wide of margins, but I bought them at a deeper discount, which means I still make about the same average profit and it's harder to find the money. Like it's just, it's a cycle. When the interest rates come back down, it'll be harder to get the good deals again and easy to find the money again. And it's just, it's, it's, you can make money in any market. It's just about, you have to know how to underwrite your deals properly.
Yeah. And then staying consistent, like you're still doing the same marketing, talking the same people. A lot of people yep. like the market takes a dip and then they're like, oh, well, I'm not going to I'm going to stop my mailers and do nothing. And then they w- decide they want to start again and think yep. the momentum's still going to oh, be there. Dude, that's it's like, snowball, no, man. you stop mailing them. <laughs> that's a snowball. And I and I, oh, I teach my students. I'm like, dude, you're marketing for deals. That's your money machine. Like for yeah, every exactly. dollar you put Never in. Never stop. You're going to be able to 10, 20 X, 30, a hundred X that dollar, depending on like, if I put, spend five grand on marketing and I get two deals that net me, you know, 50 grand each, that means I spend five, I get a hundred. Why would I turn that off? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's ridiculous. I, I, I look at all marketing, everything that I've ever spent on marketing. It's always, if I just get one deal, it pays for it. So, yeah, it so what if I get yeah. two? It's like, it's a no brainer. Like you yeah. just have to be good enough to get one. And then if you yeah. can get one. It's all you have to do is like we do. You just push the snowball. It's you got you got to you got to suck it up until that first deal comes. That's the hard part. Yeah, it's yeah. Like, oh, it three is month, tough. Three months yeah. in, five grand a month, no deal. Ah, yeah, yeah. You have a win. couple ah. phone calls, and you're like, yeah. oh, that was close. You know. Yeah. 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 So you talked about your students. So tell us a little bit about the closing table mastermind, because there, there's a lot of masterminds out there. But I know mm-hmm. you personally, and I know you're in it for to help people. Yeah. What what What's the difference between what you, you're doing in your mastermind? Not compare it against others, sure. but why did you create one and, and how are you helping people do exactly yeah. what you did? That's why I love that we've gone to yeah. the full origin story because it's like, you really like, this is only six years. Six years, man. So the Closing Table Mastermind is, I don't know, man. It's my way of doing what I feel like God's telling me to do. So that first deal that we talked about, you know, in a funny way, which because it's a funny story, but when you, when you really unpack that first deal, what happened was I had a panic attack because I didn't know how I was going to take care of my new wife financially. That was scary. I learned about real estate in that panic attack. 90 days later, I bought my first house. I did it with only a thousand dollars of my own money and bad credit. And then that house was cash flowing enough to pay for itself, all of its expenses and put a little money in my pocket every month. Like I had generated income from thin air, it felt like. And the relief that that made me feel like I found this way to make money. And then the bank called me and said, I would want to give you a line of credit on that equity, which gave me access to another like $25,000. Like I went from a panic attack about not knowing how to make, (laughs) to take care of my family to real estate property paying me and access to $25,000 in 90 days. It was like, I was so overwhelmed both with a sense of relief, but more importantly, the, the feeling I felt after I got access to that line of credit was responsibility. Like I, I just knew that God didn't lead me down this path and help open all these doors so that I could just learn how to be wealthy. Like I knew that, like, I thought I didn't know how to take care of my family. And now I know I found the thing that'll take care of us financially for the rest of our lives. Like there are so many other people who are just right there and don't know it yet. And I feel like it was, I was being told, like, I have this responsibility to help people. So that's when I started my social media. I didn't, I didn't start it because I thought I was going to get, you know, lots of followers. I, (laughs) I didn't, I didn't even know about social media at the time. Like I just started like sharing what I was doing. Um, and so this program, uh, I started as a way to help people from a very, you know, tactical, an intentional standpoint. It takes a lot of my time and I share a lot of my resources. And so like, I want to help at all levels. I help for free on social media. There's tons of, you can watch my videos and learn great free stuff and go and go implement it if you want to and make money. I have very, very inexpensive courses. Like you can, I literally think you can pay like $9 for any one of my courses right now. Like (laughs) they're so, and it's, and it's the same kind of course somebody would charge you two or $300 for. Like I help people very inexpensively, but I wanted something where I could actually mentor people, which takes my time. It takes my res I share my resources. I have, you know, staff that help me with it. Like, and so it's, it's more involved, but that, you know, means it has to cost something. But at the end of the day, we, what I teach is more acquisition. Like I teach you how to solve those two problems. I'm going to teach you how to build up lead flow 
and I'm going to teach you how to become a fundamentally sound investor by understanding all the ways you can underwrite a deal. I think too many times yeah. people are out here and they learn like one or two ways to finance a deal. And then they're out in the public trying to hammer every deal they find with that one type of financing, right? That's why yeah. everybody's everybody's owner financing or sub to every deal they find or they're out here. Yeah. Like if you don't have a 20% down payment, why are you trying to use a conventional loan? Like you don't, yeah, you, don't yeah. you can't do that, right? And so yeah. I feel like deals, the kind of financing you need to use needs to intersect that. Is it best for the deal? And is it best for my financial situation? And where those things intersect, that's the financing you should use. But you have to know multiple ways to get a deal underwritten to be able to do that. And so those are the things we teach. Yeah. And and what what does the seller really want? Because I think like the the original teachings were all, well, just tell them that you have cash and they'll need it. And, <laughs> and then, of course, I figured out like most people don't care about cash. They need you to solve it's a problem. A myth they don't know anyway. What, yeah, no, it's one silly. Show, no one shows up to a house with a burlap sack yeah. with a dollar sign on it and says, give me your house. Like there's that's not a thing. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's it's just seems silly because okay, you have a bunch of cash. The person's lived in the house fifty years. What do they care about cash? You know, right. their their equities at a hundred. They they don't know where they're going. They're, they're hoarders. They have stuff yeah. everywhere. They need help. Right. You know, and that's yeah. where it goes to the person to person thing. You know, you can't just do it. I know people do it virtually, but there's still this connection aspect where you have 100%. to figure out. You know you know, what, what's going to happen? Where are they going to go? If they don't know where they're going to go, you're not buying the house. How are you right. buying the house? They're just going to go on the street and like, that's right. it. They have money and that's all they care about. It doesn't <laughs> make any sense. Sleeping on that bag of cash you paid. <laughs> right. On the, the burlap sack is, <laughs> yeah. becomes the pillow. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, for, for investors who are kind of winding off of a tougher market and things look like they're getting a little better from the traditional sense, what's one piece of advice based on these last six years that you would tell them to, to kind of take action quicker now, but still to be careful about, you know, how they're doing it? Yeah, I still think no matter what market, the, the two things you should be focused on if you're new is you got to know what a good deal looks like in the market you're going to buy deals in. Every market is different. Real estate is local. So you have to know yeah, what totally does a deal agree. look like in the market I'm going to buy that properties in. And then you have to know what method or methods am I going to relentlessly, consistently use month in and month out to bring me that deal. Pick one. It can be an on-market yeah. strategy. It can be an off-market strategy. It can cost you money or it can cost you time. But I promise you it'll cost you one of those two things. But yeah. pick the one that you know, without a doubt, I can relentlessly, consistently do this for the next 90 to, you know, for the next three to six months until I get a deal. And then once you get that deal under contract, I promise you, you'll figure the rest out. If you need yeah. money, if that deal's good, you'll find money. If you need contractors, if you got a deal, you'll be able to find anything you need from that point will happen. So you need to be able to focus on those two things. But most importantly right now, guys, is you got to make sure you're buying value. Like I walk into equity on day one. I am yeah, only buying value, especially now. And because I may buy value, but that doesn't mean I'm getting cash flow right now, right? I could buy a property for, you know, 70 grand less than what it's worth and it cash flow negatively. But yeah. at least I know that if I need to sell it, I can sell it. If the market <laughs> if the market turns, let's say the market turns and houses drop 20%, but I'm buying my houses at a 50% to 50 to 40% discount. That means I still got some cushion there. It means I can still get out of my deals. So if you're not yeah. buying value, you're 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 putting yourself in a in a dangerous position in this market. Yeah. And one more thing before we hop off it, in terms of figuring out what a deal is, I've always said that I, I find that a lot of newer investors just aren't seeing enough houses. Even if you want to mm -hmm. buy, you know, you live in San Diego, you don't want to buy in San Diego, you want to buy in Arkansas, you still go see houses in your area. So you start to understand that maybe the prices aren't going to match, but like you need to know what a basement looks like and know what right. to look for. You know, if you're buying off the internet, I always say, there's no pictures of the basement except for some wholesalers mm -hmm. who do a good job documenting the stuff. But MLS pictures don't have basements. Like you're not yeah. going to see the structural problems or the water in the corner. And that's where all the money is. So yeah. I feel like it's really important to build those relationships, you know, find a realtor who will at least take you out if you don't have a license, just so you can get an idea like, wow, what is it? What does a house smell like when it's right. moldy? Right. <laughs> you need to yeah. know this stuff, you know, because they don't see enough. And then they, yeah, it's fair. How can you identify a deal? If you've not even looked at 10 houses well, and, and the concepts are similar. So even if you live in San Diego and you want to invest in Ohio or something, go look at every house exactly. that looks like a fixer on Zillow. Tell the your agent one. to schedule an appointment. Go look at it. Analyze it after you go there. And yeah. then 
put in an offer. You're not wasting anybody's time. Put in an offer. Your yeah. offer is going to be $300,000 less than what they're asking. <laughs> yeah. But do it. Then you Figure get all this process. experience of what the process works like. What if somebody says yes? Then you get a great deal in your backyard. Like, just do it. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Awesome, man. It's great to finally get you on here. Is Instagram the best place for people to get in touch with you? Yeah, Instagram's, at, uh, the Instagram's the best. I'm replying to all kinds of DMs right now. So hop, uh, you know, find me on Instagram. I'm at the Henry Washington on Instagram. Send me a DM. We'll chit chat. Or my website, www.cuattheclosingtable.com, all spelled out S E E Y O U A T T H E, closingtable.com. Yeah. And your book, your Bigger Pockets book that comes out in May. Yeah, man. I'm excited. Awesome. I How's it coming? It. I finished. Yeah, yeah, they're right. I heard. Yeah, I, yeah. Well, awesome. I finished I finished the manuscript. I'm gonna have to go and add a few things, but like the bulk is is done. And that is uh, have you written a book? You have a book? Not yet. Bro, uh, it I'm, is hard. I'm working on it. <laughs> it's hard, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. I'm writing one titled of the podcast and I'm like, I already said that. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm <laughs> like, I sound hard, like I'm just repeating man. myself, yeah, you know? Yes. Yeah. But how gratifying is it for you as we wrap up to be six years ago, a thousand in the oh, bank account, man. not even thinking about real estate. You know, here you are, you were running my panel, you're on, you know, social on panels all over. And now you have a book coming out. Just explain so how cool. important that journey has been to you, because it's just very impressive. Yeah. And you really have a very centered mindset, which is what this podcast is about. And I think yeah. just from my you know, communication with you and watching, like, this is what got you here. You stayed focused after you figured out, like, this is the thing I want to do. Yeah, man. I just think I'm supposed to show people and help people. And like I said, I, that's why I started my social. I didn't have I had no idea, like growing a social media was even a thing. Like I was just posting like before and after pictures and trying to get, show people that they could do this too. And uh, that consistency and posting and just being a service to people in every business that I have, whether that's my real estate business or whether that's, you know, coaching and teaching or just interacting with people on a daily business. I just, I've learned in life that life is really about what we do for other people. And the more you do for other people, the more, you know, benefit you will see. And so, I just try to help people, man. And it's been good for me, to me. And I'll continue to do that. But writing the book is cool. I just want my kids to be able to like walk into a bookstore and see something that I wrote. Like, that's just cool. <laughs> yeah. I just had Devon on and I was like, I knew he had just, he, he had a picture of himself with his book on the airport. I was like, man, that's badass. You know, that's, that's cool, <laughs> you're standing there, and I know that's going to be the same feeling for you. You're just there yeah. and like, there's your book and your kids are looking like, who's that? Like, no, that's yeah. me. Yeah, that's man, awesome. Yeah, cool. well, congratulations. I'm really Thank excited you. for you. And thanks so much for spending the time. Thanks, John. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Yeah, man. All right. That was Henry Washington. I'm Jonathan Green. We'll see you next episode. I hope you enjoyed that episode of Zen and the Art of Real Estate Investing with me, Jonathan Green. And I just want to remind you, and this is always an uncomfortable part, I don't want you to think that I'm begging for you to like, subscribe, follow, do whatever you have to do for the podcast, leave a five-star review. But if you like the podcast and you think it adds value in the real estate investing sphere, then just do me a personal favor. Like the podcast, follow it, share it when you can with your friends. And be so kind as to write a five-star review if you believe it deserves a five-star review up against what else is out there. I would really appreciate it, and I hope you keep listening.